Hello, Mauricio. How are you, my friend? Hi, Sunny. I'm great. How are you? I am. I am likewise, and I am very, very excited for our wonderful guest today. But before we dive in, I would love for you to introduce yourself quickly to the audience, and uh, we'll get to our guest here pretty quickly. Sure. Real quick. Hi, guys. I'm Mudasir, Leadership and Transformation Coach. I work with teams and leaders to identify opportunities and challenges in order to operate at their best. So that's that's my short introduction, Sai. Excellent, excellent, and good to be together. And likewise, I'm Sai, and uh, I'm a transformation and change, if you will, consultant and coach, and I partner with organizations to really help them bring their business model, operating models, uh, in calibration for the greatest impact. I love to work with Budasir and others uh, and, and definitely have leveraged the wisdom of people like uh, Wendy, who you'll be uh, meeting today to really help clients really embrace the reality that we deal with, the human nature that we deal with, their own identity, and ensure that their awareness essentially helps them make the greatest impact in the world. Um, so with that, Mauricio, if you're good, I'm going to offer just some kind of quick perspective as to why Wendy, because I always we always get the why question and then definitely yes. bring her in. Is that reasonable? Yeah, most certainly. Please go ahead. Wonderful. So very exciting week with the book being published uh, uh, this week, if you will. There's one particular quote which which got to the heart of it all, and I want to mention it and, and definitively emphasize it. And Wendy and, 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 and Marianne really say, tensions make us human, and they help connect us with one another, reading ancient, ancient and modern texts and literature, philosophy, psychology, uh, organizational theory, and so forth, reminds us of that ongoing tensions are part of the perpetual human condition. Uh, that is so foundational. So this work, respectfully, that Wendy and, 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 and likewise Marianne are offering is impacting everything. Wendy specifically, these and, and Marianne have established the foundation to paradox thinking. And now they are truly offering us, if you will, a lens through which to, to deal with the challenges that we have ahead of us. Now more than ever, that lens and that system of tools that Wendy is, is going to be talking a little bit about with us today and then in the book, uh, help us navigate these tumultuous times in favor of the human condition, if you will. And I say in favor because we need to bring all those into balance. Without being any longer uh, long-winded, all around, the pioneer, the visionary, the humanist, if you will, and that we can all take so much from, I really, really want to appreciate the time that you've offered us, Wendy. So welcome. So I thank you so much for having me. And Mudasir, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. The, the, the pleasure is ours. And, and Wendy, the, the key question that we want to start off with, you know, who is the Wendy Smith? I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I thank you for starting off in the way that you did. I love the introduction because indeed, Marianne Lewis, my co-author, and I really do think about the extent to which paradoxes and navigating paradoxes are part of the human condition. We live in these competing demands. We live in these interwoven opposites and knowing how to and understanding them and then knowing how to embrace them is indeed, I think, critical to how we go ahead in our world in so many of the big problems we face and so many of the uh, sort of individual problem, organizational issues we face, individual issues. I'll just say one word. I started studying these ideas in grad school as a PhD uh, because I started studying innovation and I was studying how leaders of IBM navigated this tension between today and tomorrow. Um, that said, I moved to studying this tension of uh, what we now know as ESG or uh, environmental social goals, uh, governance goals, or sustainability or corporate responsibility, and studying this tension of corporations navigating social and financial. And over the years, Marianne and I have been working together now for 20, 25 years. Over the years, we just see these paradoxes everywhere, and they show up in our personal lives, they show up in our organizational lives. And that's why we wrote the book, to ask how we can navigate, understand them and then navigate them better. Great, great. Thank you, Wendy. And, and uh, for us and the audience, can you help us to distinguish or distinct between tensions, dilemmas, and, and paradoxes? And, and if you can share some light on that, that would be great. Yeah, I love that question. And here's how we think about it. And so I, I just want to suggest that this notion of paradox, where we feel like we've made a contribution, is helping to surface them in the conversation about 
our organizations, in the conversation about our society, in the conversation about our individual lives. This notion of paradox goes back 2,500 years. I mean, this is an idea that uh, we're built, I mean, talk about building on the shoulders of giants. We're building on ideas from, from Eastern philosophy, from Western philosophy, 2,500 years ago. Here's how we understand those ideas. We uh, would suggest that we experience these tug of war dilemmas in our lives, these issues, these, con these, these conflicting demands. So whether it's an organizational leader trying to navigate the tensions of innovation that shows up as, do I focus on today or tomorrow? Or whether it's us in our personal lives trying to navigate you know, work family tensions or increasingly uh, lots of people are navigating work from home tensions. Or by the way, whether it's in our politics as we're navigating these, you know, how we attend to these tensions, these tug of wars between more conservative politics and more liberal politics coming and clashing with each other. We would say those are the dilemmas. There's these dilemmas that show up that sort of demand us to demand an answer from us. And underlying those, lurking within, we sometimes say, those dilemmas, the question of am I spending this hour or this evening at home with my family at family dinner or at work finishing work, that's the dilemma that demands an answer. But lurking within those dilemmas are these paradoxes that are these interwoven opposites that never go away. And those are the tensions between today and tomorrow or work and life or stability and change or love and hate or what uh, these opposites that actually inform one another. They are interwoven. And those are the paradoxes that, it, that are underlying our dilemmas. So these two concepts are related. It's just the question is at what level are we seeing the issues that we face? And we talk about all of those overall as tensions. Great, great. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. And, and you did mention and we are dealing with tensions and paradoxes over 2,500 years. So the question is, why now more than ever? Yeah. And, and that's that's the immediate question. Anyone gets it. So can you help us walk through your thought process on that, please? Yeah. You know, Mudasir, I will, I'll tell you that in writing a book, anyone who's written a book, like there's so much that gets left off at the chopping block. We had a great, we had a chapter that I loved, my favorite, that ended up not making it in, where we looked at this long history of paradox. And wow. indeed, part of that conversation, and 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 this is in the book, but part of that what we what we map over time is how Eastern and Western thought really split around this notion of competing demands for quite some time. And rational Western thought looked at competing demands as either or opposites. And now we're seeing this reintegration into understanding competing demands as interdependent, as paradoxical. And we see this in the world of quantum physics and really rethinking our physical world to say this complex idea that matter, that we are both in motion and at rest, that we are both a wave and a particle, that we exist and don't exist. I mean, this gets a little heady. We see this in psychoanalysis that the human condition, that we both are expansive and restrictive. So, so why now in organizations and in our sort of broader social life? And we argue that there's three conditions that drive or that surface these paradoxes, make them more salient. Uh, the first is when there is more change because there is more tension between today and tomorrow, yesterday and today, that temporal tension, that that temporal paradox, when there is more scarcity or the experience of scarcity, when resources feel limited and there's more um, tension and conflict around who gets those, that surfaces these paradoxes. And when there is more, the word that we use is plurality or different mm -hmm. perspectives, because right. which is a great thing. And it surfaces these paradoxes because people are coming at things from different perspectives. So change, Scarcity, plurality, we are seeing a lot of that in our world right now. And I think that is one of the reasons that we, and by the way, lots of people are starting to talk about paradoxes in both anding. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Wendy, I want to hone in on a particular word that you've used a couple of times in the conversation. I'd love for you to elaborate it, the, the word demand. 
It's, yeah. it's, yeah, please, you know, what's demanded of us? How does it relate to the human condition? And, and your wisdom and guidance is always appreciated there. Yeah. So, you know, I love that you started us off with the human condition because I do think that if we go back to, you know, words of Lao Tzu, words of Confucius, on, on, and the Western side, words of Heraclitus, right? Heraclitus was the Greek philosopher famous for saying, no person steps in the same river twice because the person is always changing and the river is always changing. And inherent in that idea is this tension between stability and change today and tomorrow. And so, um, you know, in, so going back to those texts, what, we, what we've argued is that paradox, and it's exactly the word you're saying, is part of the human condition. The world sort of rests in this prism of yin yang on the edge, teetering on the edge of, of, of you know, flow and, and status. Like we're, we're constantly living in that condition. Um, and if that is the case, if we, if we accept that assumption, then we have to navigate. We have to live within them. We have to confront that. And I think that, again, one of the reasons we wrote this book, you know, one of our first arguments in this book is that it's so anxiety provoking to live in that space because it feels very irrational and very ambiguous and very, you know, very uncertain. And, and, and there's so many books out now about dealing with ambiguity and uncertainty. But what we would say is that part of the reason we go to this either or space we try and say these things are we pull them apart and we try and make a decision between these opposing demands is because that helps us in the short term feel more comfortable and the question is can we you know can we find some comfort we talk about finding comfort in the discomfort can we find some emotional comfort in dealing with the discomfort of the ambiguity of the irrationality of paradox that's not easy. I don't want to say at all that's easy. We are all in a constant learning process to understand that and to live in that space. Sai, so you're on mute. Forgive me. My apologies. I got so excited I put myself on mute just <laughs> listening to it. So my apologies. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, Wendy, you mentioned that you looked at the history, if you will, of paradox. And, and some of this didn't make it in the book respectfully, as, as, as you mentioned. Were there some epiphanies that grabbed you as you did that? Were there things that you could highlight for us, if you will, not seeing that published work that we can, yeah. we can really work with? And we will publish that somewhere at some point. Beautiful. So stay tuned. Uh, yeah. but, and, um, you know, I, I think that the reason that the history is so intriguing to me is, in fact, because if we think 25, like if we think to the 500s BCE, right, like to that era, we have to recognize, like, the, there's no internet, there's no airplanes. These are people generating, and by generating ideas across the globe in different places that are really resonant with one another. And, you know, and, and it's not just East-West. I want to sort of, for fear of overstating East-West divides, uh, you know, I have a colleague, Medhani Gain, who I absolutely, uh, you know, fantastic scholar currently in Sweden, originally from Ethiopia, who has written about and brought up, you know, Ubuntu and, and insights that have come out of Africa that are all really resonant around this same topic of the ways in which there are these interdependencies of competing demands. I find that fascinating because while we don't fully know where the trade routes are and how information and idea flowed across those trade routes to inform one another, what it says to me is that these were deeper insights that were emergent from different thinkers in different places without that kind of interaction and communication. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Most definitely. You know, I also honed in on, on as, as I looked at the, of course, the book and it just came out beautifully, beautifully, of course, incredibly accessible, I'll put it that way. The, the, the word comfort, if you will, I would love your insights on where you see the balance between, I'll say very particularly, the, the notion of comfort and the notion of control or ego, our own ego entering the picture, Wendy. Right. Oh, so, you know, first of all, I love being able to traverse the spaces between organizational consulting and management consulting and working with organizations and truly the role in which there's a kind of therapeutic piece to this. Uh, and we know that that's true for organizational leaders, which is how do we grapple with our own challenges, the things that stand in our own way. Uh, indeed, control 
you know, we sort of talk about how in order to shift into paradox and live in paradox, we've got to let go of some control. We've got to be able to, and we talk about coping instead of controlling, because sometimes these paradoxes surface for us as a more serendipitous answer. We talk about, you know, it's important to accept that things will shift and change over time. And if we hold too tightly, what we're doing is holding really tightly to one point of view and not being open to others. And in that, and to your point, is an emotional component. So I want to just give a quick example to, to ground this because, you know, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is, is polar, political polarization, the extent to which people take a particular side of an argument and the extent to which we are in conflict. We see that in the political realm so profoundly and so problematically. It's one of the things, I think one of the biggest issues holding us up from move, making progress on some of our world's biggest issues is our own conflicts with one another. And, and by the way, we can see this in organizations too. It's not just in the political realm in which we can't move forward in the organization because the R&D and innovative folks are in an ongoing debate with the finance folks or whoever it is that's sitting on two different sides of an issue, each of them grounding in to their particular point of view and really you know, shooting at sort of, we talk about this as trench warfare because trench warfare is each side is digging deeper and deeper into its own trench, grounding okay. into its own point of view and, and shooting at the other side. So, Sai, I want to just bring this back to your question, which is, how do we get to a better place? We get to a better place by listening to the other side, by accepting that the other side has a point of view. We might not agree, but we have to start by being in conversation to see the possible interwovenness. And to do that, we have to do two things. We have to let go of our need for control of our perspective, and we have to be emotionally uncomfortable with the, and have the courage to listen and engage with perspectives that we don't necessarily agree with. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Modus, if you're good, I'm gonna ask another question if that's all right, unless, you, unless you've got no, something. No, go, go on, go on, please go ahead. So this is kind of a, when, uh, to, to really anchor this for people that are listening, I'm sure it's burning through their minds to ask this. So I wanna kind of ask it in two parts, if you will, and please you know, kind of see where you'd like to take us. The, the paradox system that you offer in the book is tremendous, a lens through which to engage the world, to engage in a very practical sense, if you will. That's, that's, that's key. So I'd love for you to talk about that. Yeah. In the context of, if you will, I'm an individual or I'm on a team or I'm working with an organization and I've got, I'm dealing with all these things. I've got a very, very uh, perhaps um, over the top, I'll say, introduce whatever words you'd like, if you will, over the top individual or other parties that are not willing to work to find mm -hmm. that that situation, you know, to find the, the both and. How can I use the paradox system to help me navigate and make traction? All in your hands, Wendy. By how much time do we have to? There you go. <laughs> exactly. Well, start us off definitely, and then people need to get the book to read it, quite honestly, to really absorb it and put it into practice. Yes. I appreciate that. So let me start with the paradox system very briefly, maybe just to invite people into a deeper exploration on their own. And the idea of the paradox system is uh, that we base, we argue, and the reason we wrote this book is because we've seen increasingly, to your to your point and Mudasir, to your question about why now, we see more and more people using language of both and. And what we have been able to do, and we've been studying this for the last, again, 20, 25 years, what we've been able to do is pull together our own research and the research of our colleagues to say, how do we do this better? Let's move beyond the label of just calling something both and and saying, how do we do this better? And this system, and we unpack this in more depth in the book, says the way to navigate paradox is not just one thing, that we've got to think about how, how we think about issues, our cognition, our assumptions. We've got to talk about how we feel about these issues because our emotions are critical. So how do we feel about these issues? So thinking and feeling. We've got to talk about the structures that we create in our lives uh, and in our organizations that scaffold us to be able to hold both and, and what are those structures? And in the midst of those very stable structures, we also have to create the conditions where we're dynamically shifting. So those are the four buckets. It's not about picking one, it's about engaging all of these. And the way, you know, and we sort of spent a lot of time on this one, but we frame it as 
A, B, C, D in buckets, assumptions, how we think about things, boundaries, the scaffolding and structure, comfort, the emotions, and dynamism, A, B, C, D. And we call it the paradox system because these are the buckets to navigate paradox. And, and here's the complex, here's paradox, here's the 2.0 point. These things themselves are paradoxical. So we got to deal with individuals and how individuals change and how the structure system context environment changes. It's not one or the other. And in fact, I hear that either or so many times. Like if you talk to people about social movements or, you know, the Black Lives Matters movements or the feminist movement, do we change the people or do we change the system? Well, both. We do both. Right. And then when it comes to changing the people, there's often this tension between the head and the heart, the emotions and the cognition, the rational and the, the, the intuitive. It's both. You know, and then when it comes to the structures, is it about stable structures that enable us to change or is it about making change and dynam dynamic change? It's both. So that's sort of the heart of it. I hope I've given enough context to invite people to go deeper. Um, so I want to answer your second question, but let me pause there because I don't want to say too much all at once, but I, I'm happy to answer your second question, which is, well, what do you, where, how do you start, I think is your second question. And how do you start with other people? So is that, should, should I keep going or, yeah. Uh, yeah most definitely. Yeah. For, yeah. I put myself on mute again, not to interrupt you. <laughs> so yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> my pleasure. Uh, so that's the, that's the big idea and the big goal and that, you know, and, you know, I think that there are sort of two places to start. We've been talking about one big place, but there's really there's two to respond to your question. And we sort of liken this. We, we sort of use the metaphor of people who want to learn to meditate and sort of the depths of meditation. It's a lifelong practice. And if you go to a meditation studio, they'll say the first step is start with your breath. So get stuck. So what we would say is that engaging paradox, both and thinking is a lifelong practice, lots to learn and engage and remind ourselves along the way. The first step is changing the question. Uh, this is sort of professional hazard for myself and for Marianne that when we hear an either or question, it's sort of, you know, how can we change an either or question? Do I, am I more career oriented or more, uh, family oriented? Am I working from home or working from work? You know, into a, how can I be more effective as an employee by both, nav by navigating both home and all of the focus time that it allows me and being in person and all of the connection time? How can I do both? So the first step is changing the question. And Sai, and we can unpack this a little more, when it comes to being with other people that are either oring, our first step there is listening. That we're not going to be able to invite people into both and into hearing our perspective if we don't start by listening to them first. Great, great. So, so are they? Then, then the immediate question comes to head: Is are people really listening? The either or questions or or the understanding the paradox here so yeah. what, what is your take on that i mean i think it's like an onion <laughs> where <laughs> and in fact we've been doing some research and, and what i mean by that and then i'll tell you about this research what i think people have to start and engage at the level in which they are able everybody sort of starts at a different like at the at the peel the onion to the level that they are able and start there and move and and the goal and our hope with this book is that we can help people move from wherever they're starting a little bit further into this process. And, and so I was saying, we've been doing some research, I've been doing some research with my colleague, Natalie Slowinski, uh, on an amazing organization called Shorefast in Newfoundland run by an incredible woman named Zita Cobb. So people should go check out uh, Shorefast and the Fogo Island Inn where Zita Cobb moved back to Newfoundland from Ottawa and from, from being the second highest paid female executive in Canada to open up this social enterprise. And the key, what we find is as a leader and as an incredibly paradoxical leader and incredibly complex thinker, she is often communicating with people through stories and through metaphors and through um, sometimes singing, but that the in, that the reason that that's so powerful with such complex ideas is that uh, it invites people to engage in those ideas at the level that they can. 
And we use in it, you know, we, we talk about Zita in the book and we use this example. She has this great um, poem from a New Zealand poet, The Art of Walking Upright. The Art of Walking Upright is having two feet. And I'm not saying the poem exactly right. So I want to, you know, I want to apologize. The, but one for reaching out and one for being stable, one for staying grounded. And And she often recites that poem to people because the idea of reaching out and moving forward while staying grounded you know, people can then move into and think about, well, what does that mean for me in my world? And how can I think about that in my world in the way that I am most comfortable pushing forward and thinking about it? Excellent. Nice, nice. Uh, uh, beautifully expressed. Wendy, as you, as as the message is proliferating and you've, you've definitively, you know, have a, a, a historical record of sharing this wisdom, and you mentioned, I want to say four key words and then ask a very specific question to it. You said, mentioned the thinking, right? The feeling, the, the structures, the, sh the, the dynamics, if you will, and the dynamism and shifting. And as you hear those words, if you will, if I'm an executive in an organization, feeling doesn't always resonate for me. And so would love to hear kind of how you're experiencing the world as it's digesting this message, if you will. Right. It's such a good question. I uh, was invited to to um, come into a, a large finance organization in Hong Kong and share these ideas. And in part, it was the CEO who came into this organization, a hundred year old organization with some real clear values of being disciplined, but also being really, you know, human centric. And and um, he said, look, this is a you know, these are really great values, but we also not only have to be disciplined, we have to be innovative and we not only have to be, you know, human centric, we also have to be digitally centric. And his point and people started to get nervous. Well, he's going to change everything up. And his point was, no, we want to value where we have been in the past and introduce these new things. So part of what he had to do and invited me to help him do was to create some language around that. Now, that might not be him delving into deep emotional feelings where people are, are spilling their emotions in his office, but it is recognizing that level of anxiety and inviting in people to say, hey, by the way, this is really uncomfortable and, and being okay with that, setting the conditions where they're okay with that. And I think, you know, Sai, what's really important is that if we're talking to the leaders who are listening, the leaders set the context and what we think is really important is that if you're going to, and we think, you know, you should be setting a context in which you are engaging competing ideas. And if you're going down at the same, you know, sort of these paradoxes, if you're going to go down that road, you don't get to choose between whether you're helping to change people's mindsets or their, you know, minds or hearts. You don't get to choose between whether you scaffold and create the structures and boundaries or whether you create more dynamic, experimental practices for serendipity. If you're going to do this well, you really have to be engaging all of these. Now, you could start in different places, but it's like any system, they reinforce one another. And so if you, and, and probably, and this is what we have seen, I've seen this with several leaders I've worked with. If you ask people to try and cognitively accept both and, okay, that's great, but then you don't deal with how uncomfortable that is and how uncomfortable that feels when we're in conflict with people, the emotions, the emotions will sabotage the cognition. So we kind of have to really be thinking about all these components. Wonderful. And and just to emphasize something, and please comment after, I had emphasis and please comment relative to it, Wendy. I think one of the, the, the powers, if you will, of this wisdom in particular, and the way that it's being expressed is, it's not simply talking about feelings, but it's really putting them in the context of, in this case, a business or an executive or something where it can be channeled and and really advance us forward together versus just just talking about feelings. Yeah, and so I want to go a little meta here because one of the reasons that leaders don't talk about feelings is because it makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. And the invitation for leadership, and this is sort of beyond just the scope of this book, but you know, I think of some of the great leaders that I've learned from, people like Warren Bennis and his brilliant, you know, book and I had the chance to learn with and from him. The invitation to leaders, you know, maybe Brené Brown and and Daring Greatly is to actually be able to deal with the comfort of their own discomfort of dealing with emotions because yeah. we are emotional people and emotions drive our behaviors as much as our cognition does. And so again, if we either or, 
in how we navigate organizations by just saying we're going to the rational, we're going to the cognitive, we're going to, and, and then we miss out on the emotions, we miss out on that paradoxical interwoven relationship. And so great leaders know that they have to be vulnerable and that they have to engage the emotional experience of their employees, both get, get them passionate, emotionally passionate about the issue and deal with their emotional anxieties if they're gonna align people to be able to get their work done. So there is a both and in there, and there's something a little more meta about inviting leaders to have, to deal with the comfort or find comfort in the discomfort of their experience of not feeling comfortable with emotions. So, so I think there's some deep work to be done there. <laughs> well said, very, very well said. Uh, oh, yes, and, and definitively it's not easy work. It's work it's that we- It's not easy work. Yeah. Yeah. And so I wanted to say one more thing, because I know that Please. we've gone into a world in which there's a lot of coaching. Um, but I want to say, and I want to say that one of the things we find with both anding, and it's not surprising, this is not, this is going to be one of those ahas that need be said, but, but once it's said is not that surprising, is that it's always easier to see other people's both ands. It's always easier to see how other people should find comfort in the discomfort than to do it ourselves. And there is huge value in either coaching, and I'll just praise the, the effective and the great coaches of the world, uh, you know, consultants, but having other people help you with this. One of our, my colleagues at George Washington University, Vani Pamphile, did a paper recently where she talked about having paradox peers, which are the peers that are engaged with these kinds of tensions, but outside of your organization, because other people can help us see past our own discomfort. And I think that that's really powerful to remind ourselves, this isn't easy and we are in community and that community can help us think about these ideas. Great, great. So uh, while speaking of comfort and discomfort, uh, Wendy, one quick thing that, that crosses my head is accepting the discomfort is it is it really finding you a comfort with discomfort or, or how do you put it say say more so if you are discomfortable for with something or, yeah. or, or in a given situation and you experience that for multiple times yeah. you will build a muscle to be comfortable with with that sort of discomfortness yeah yeah so, and i think yeah go ahead, go ahead. Well, I think it sounds good to say finding comfort in the discomfort. Comfort fits with the C word for our A, B, C, D. And Mudasir, I think you're pointing to something deeper, which is what does that really mean? And, mm -hmm. you know, here, one of, of my favorite books and people to follow is Tara Brock, who is a, a Buddhist psychologist. She wrote the book Radical Acceptance. And okay. in some way, the word acceptance might be a better word for than comfort, right? So it's not that the discomfort all of a sudden becomes fine. It's and, and maybe eventually it does. It's that we invite ourselves to be okay with the discomfort, to accept the discomfort, to know that I feel frustrated or I feel annoyed or I feel anxious and to say yes to that anxiety. You know, I, I feel like the, the pandemic put these issues on the table so profoundly because there was so much deep fear and so much anxiety. And Sai, like to your point, therefore we tried to really control things that we had so little information about and so little potential to control. And um, that's where people went because that's how people were trying to minimize the discomfort. Instead of saying, you know, yeah, like this is really uncomfortable and I feel a lot of fear and I feel a lot of anxiety. And that's mm -hmm. true for leaders and organizations. That's true for all of us, you know, employees and organization is, how can we stop by saying like, yeah, this is uncomfortable. I feel it. Great. Thank you, Wendy. And then on, on the same topic side, do you have any follow-up question or anything to add so that we, we can make, we can get more sort of from Wendy? Definitely. Definitely. Thank you for that. And most definitely. So, so I, I, just one phrase, if you will, that comes to my mind that, that we commonly use is embracing reality rather mm -hmm. than rejecting it is, yeah. is something that's very, very, and, and you have to build the muscle and you have to work with paradigms such as what when you the, the tools and the, the wisdom that you're offering us because if you don't work with them then then you really aren't working with much right. respectfully but yeah I, I have one particular question and, and if you don't mind could you, yeah. this is this, uh, this is somewhat of a personal question on, on my mm -hmm. part I'll put it that way uh, I'm gonna mention her name our daughter if you will Nora who's in her uh, she may 
she may get upset with me, but she's in her mid to upper 20s. Let's put it that way. But helping children, and this is something that we did as parents, helping children really embrace both and thinking. Any wisdom guidance for parents to really, really, you know, channel that? Yeah, Asai, thank you for taking us on so many different realms in this conversation, because indeed that's where we've been going with these ideas. Um, You know, my kids almost roll their eyes at this point when I say, when they're, so I have twins uh, who are uh, now about to be 16 and they kind of roll their, you know, and so I see the conflict between them and they roll their eyes when I say to them, is there a both and, Uh, you know, just asking the question. Uh, And I also now that they're 16, hear them, and I've been saying this since they've been five or four, and I now hear them come back to me and say, mom, I think there's a both and, or here's the possible both and, or what do you think about the both and? And, you know, so I I do think that there's huge value, you know, um, uh, helping kids move beyond the black and white and be able to, and, you know, the, and, and be able to see the nuance and be able to listen to other people when they are in conflict. Uh, when, when my kids come to me and tell me about a conflict with a friend, oftentimes I will ask them, well, have you listened to what they're challenged by? What, what's going on for them? Um, which is not always easy, you know, or what would it look like to take the perspective of your teacher who you're frustrated with because they gave you yet another essay to write this week, you know? So I I do think that there are some great and simple initial tools to invite us to think about another person's perspective in conflict or to think about our own either ors. And again, it goes back to inviting us, inviting our kids to change the question because it opens up an alternative solution space just by asking back to them when they give us their either ors what the both and would look like so it's and i think it's incredibly powerful and i hope more parents do start think inviting their kids to start thinking this way excellent excellent and, and i, I and, and please correct me if i'm wrong with all due respect wendy i think you have given us the paradox system is very much a tool that parents can use to reflect on how mm-hmm. they would engage children in the best way to help them achieve that degree of, of really engagement with the reality and the experiences that are forthcoming to them. Yeah, I hope so. And again, you know, when we put out this system, uh, we thought about it and and we sort of speak about it as not just a set of tools for, it, it is a set of tools for organizational leaders to think about the organization. It's also a set of tools for us individually. I love the invitation. It's a set of tools for us to think about how we structure uh, and create the conditions for our kids to think paradoxically. I love that. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I, I know we, we've, we've uh, you know, we're, we're coming up on time shortly. If you will, Wendy, if, Mudis, if you don't have anything else, I, I, if, if you're Yeah, gonna... and then and only, only thing to share from my end is the ABCD concept of paradox system is very powerful. And, and I, from my personal front, it is very easy to implement personally and professionally. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for sharing your great insights. My pleasure. Thank you. And, and Wendy, sort of, you know, closing comments, wisdom that you'd like to leave us with beyond definitively, you know, diving deeper into the book and what have you, but anything you'd like to share with our audience and, and what have you, Wendy? Well, so I, I, you know, I just want to say thank you to both of you for having me because, um, you know, again, we wrote this book because we've been thinking about it for a long time. And the more that we delve into these ideas, the more that we realize that it is either or thinking, or, or I'll say it differently, we face a lot of problems in our world. And we really deeply believe that shifting our mindset, shifting our approach from either oring, from atomistically pulling things apart, and instead to be able to invite us into seeing a more holistic picture across different perspectives, a more holistic picture across different needs, and it will enable us to push forward on these issues. So thank you for helping us. We uh, spread that idea. We hope that this is useful to people in their personal lives, in their parenting, in their leadership, in their organiz- you know, in their work as an employee. We hope that we can help push people along a little bit in that, in that thank you. journey. So thank you. Th- thank you so much. And, and I, I highly recommend folks really take a look <clears throat> at the work. And, and, and Wendy, as I mentioned in the beginning, when, you, when, when we welcomed you into the conversation, truly a visionary, a humanist, if you will, charting the way, establishing the foundations. And if I can use one last quote from your book, if you don't mind, if you will, and, and please give our best to Marianne by all means. Should, love both of you, quite honestly. 
you emphasize in the book from from uh, 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 Carl Carl Jung, if you will, that only the paradox, if you will, mm -hmm. comes anywhere near to comprehending the fullness of life. So the message to folks, respectfully, if you want to experience that fullness of life, do not overlook the wisdom that Wendy and Marianne are mm -hmm. offering us. Do not overlook. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much, Wendy. Thanks a lot, Wendy. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.